Tom. So we wanted to do this for the community and in order to feed us and get our free food, I'm going to give a talk about um, uh, our research here and our program here. And it's not only for the free food, although that's really nice, but it's for, <laughs> it's because um, we have young Native American students coming here for our summer program and all kinds of different students from all kinds of different communities. And we're interested in health disparities research because our tribal people and also some other minority community people are dying at a, at a higher or at a lower age than most other people. And we miss these people and we need these people and we need our elders to stay around as long as they can. And so what we're going to talk about today, or what I'm going to talk about, is the research we're doing to help our students, or the activities we plan to help our students see about these health disparities, understand these health disparities, and then do something about them. So my name is Tammy Greer. <laughs> I'd, like to open, I'd like to open by um, asking Carol Davidson to say a prayer. Uh, I guess I want to do a quick uh, introduction just for Ryan, just real quick before I start the prayer. Uh, Ryan was one of my students in high school at South Park Central, and uh, when I heard of Ryan passing, he was I can't hear it. It hit me. It hurt me really bad. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> through this pandemic, during the whole summer, I've lost uh, five former students. They were all in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And Ryan uh, was a great student of mine in 10th grade. He made me laugh. Uh, main thing about Ryan was uh, he was humble. That's one word I always like to describe Ryan. He was humble and he was respectful. And Something I can enjoy speaking talk about. Anything you have to do with talk about, uh, you always listen. You always be included. And I'm honored to be here uh, along with the family members. Uh, everyone here for Ryan and just here in general. Place. I offer my respect 
to the living descendants of those people and to those who still occupy this territory as a sovereign nation, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. And this is my friend Pearlie, who is late, her social dance crew, and my kids are up there somewhere dancing. She's actually calling me right now. When Joe Bohannon asked me to be a co-advisor for the Golden Eagles in a Tribal Society, which was the native-focused student group on this campus that he developed, he, he organized, and to help out the power, with the powwow that he started, I agreed to help him because I know that natives are only 2% of the U.S. population. And according to the National Center for Education Statistics, we account for less than 1% of full-time faculty. So there aren't lots of us in these university positions to help out. I didn't really think about it, but at the time, Joe Bohan was a graduate student, and graduate students graduate, and then they leave, and they go get you know positions. And I'm glad I didn't think about that, because I was having, I was going to have to take over all of what he had started and be, and inherit that. And then he asked what I wanted to bring to the organization, to the campus, in order to make it a better place for natives, to bring native presence to the campus. Powwows come and powwows go, and I really hadn't thought about what I could bring to the group, but I did recall to him that I had heard our elders talking about our plant knowledge, forgetting the plant names in our original languages. And so I told him that maybe we should have a native plant garden. We were envisioning a place where elders could come and recall the plant names, teach the youth about native plants, plants that our ancestors used as building materials like Tala or Palmetto, weapons like whiskey or cane, medicines like Itti Shuna or Supple Jack, dyes like Koshiba or Pokeweed, and please forgive me if I'm butchering them, but I'm trying. <laughs> Food like Saka or Muscadine, and drink like Yopan or Aussie, like that. And we were envisioning a place where we could learn from our plant brothers and sisters even though neither of us knew really anything about native plants, we did know that these southeastern native plants allowed our ancestors to survive and thrive for thousands of years. Turns out, if you think about it, we human beings are the little brothers and sisters amongst most of our relatives. Most plants and animals have been here way longer than we have as human beings. And they know how to live on this earth sometimes better than we do, how to live in relationship with other diverse beings around them. They sacrifice themselves for us and for other beings as food and medicine and building materials and weapons and dyes, and we have to respect them for that. And we really can learn lots from them. Joe brought a photo book to me of a garden in the shape of a medicine wheel. And we all agreed on that shape for the garden. We decided to outline the garden with stones. And I knew that in forming that shape, a sacred circle, that the medicine wheel, by including our elder brothers and sisters, the plant relatives, and not only our plant relatives, but also the ancient ones, the stones, red and yellow ochre, used to paint our bodies, used by Osceola, the black drink crier, to cover his body at his death so that he would leave this world in the way he came in, half bloody. I knew that by doing that, 60 million year old seashells that were deposited in Mississippi when Mississippi was part of the sea, part of the ocean, by including the lava rocks that we use in our sweats, I knew that what we were doing was creating a sacred space on campus. So we began our garden that way by paying our respects to the ancestors, to the ancient ones, and to those in the spirit world who loved and cared for these plants much as these plants loved and cared for them. We were all imagining as well a place where natives could come and realize that there was room for them here 
that was a space, an undeniably Native space, where folks could visit and learn about Native ways, a space that our students, but not only our students, the greater Hattiesburg community, but not only them, but where everyone can come and learn about the Southeastern Native experience, our plants, our traditions, our ways. And it was a huge dream. We wrote a grant, and we received, we received money from what's called the SEBA Corporation, which is a grassroots organization that funds projects like this. And we only got a couple thousand dollars, but we did a lot with it. And then Joe, of course, as graduate students do, he graduated and he moved on and became faculty somewhere else. He <laughs> just saw the whole origin of the garden school. And we continued to build our garden. This garden is like us. She's never finished. She's never the same from day to day. She's never the same from season to season. Sometimes she changes dramatically, like here when we put in sidewalks. Other times, not so much. Our students got involved, really involved, when we asked Physical Plant to pave the paths so that um, it was the paths were wheelchair accessible. And we wanted the past to speak particularly about the Southeastern American Indian experience. We wanted the symbols and the words and the tribes to speak about the indigenous people of this place. We are the people who were not part of the removal. We remain, hid out, stayed to ourselves, and there's a legacy that results from that, from those particular experiences. Lots of folks think that Southeastern Natives are extinct. So we needed this garden to inform and inspire and speak with us about our experiences. Also, I wanted the youth to connect with their elders. And so as we drew these ancient Southeastern symbols into the past, the college students called their pookie, and they said, what's the Choctaw word for black? And they got Lusa, and they wrote it in the past. And as they wrote those Choctaw words into the concrete, I realized that when our Southern Miss students walk into the garden, they will be greeted with the words of the indigenous people of this place. And when our Choctaw students walk into the garden, they are greeted in their own language. And seeing your own language, feeling like you belong here, like there's a place for you, a place for Native students at a university is really important. In 2017, 21% of Native American children under 18 years of age lived in a household with a parent who completed a bachelor's degree, and that's compared to 52% of white households. So already, college is a foreign place for a lot of Native students. We had a group of indigenous gardeners, some of them are here today, who came the other day to help clean up the rock gardens and the medicine wheel and remove some tree limbs and just help out. And one of the gardeners saw her tribal name in the middle of the garden and she turned to her guy and she said, look, we're here, we're in this garden, our tribe is here. Here we are in the garden and that's really important. Only 19% of 18 to 24 year old Native Americans are enrolled in college compared to 41% of the overall U.S. population that age. Native Americans, both American Indians and Alaska Natives, comprise only 1% of the U.S. undergraduate population and less than 1% of the graduate population. These students are often left out of graphs of ethnic and racial differences in educational attainment because of small sample sizes, so we really do need to be more responsive to the specific needs of these students. And you can see from these graphs that natives are graduating high school at about the same rate as everyone else, but graduating with an associate's degree at about half the rate, and graduating with a bachelor's degree at about a third of the rate, and we didn't even make the chart for a master's degree or higher. And then we colored the paths. She really is a beautiful garden. Medicine will teachings are indigenous teachings that have to do with approaching ourselves, our earth, one another, all our paths, wherever they may lead in whatever circumstances, in a more holistic way, with developments occurring with successive passes around the wheel, and the balance of different aspects of ourselves 
of everything as fundamental in our journey towards wholeness and wellness and the wholeness and wellness of other beings of our planet. Medicinal teachings are used by different tribes and different organizations to serve numerous purposes, often focused on health and wellness, but also areas as diverse as mental health, end of life care, leadership, addiction, care for the environment. Different tribes have different colors for their directions or have different teachings about what occurs in those directions, but the holistic aspect and the balance is a common medicinal teaching. Those are common. And you have told us, let me see. And you have told us that there are lots of reasons why we have health disparities. So let me go through those in a minute. Let me see where I When native teachings, when native students come to us, the medicine world teachings say that they're, they are spiritual beings and emotional and physical and mental beings. And they're coming here to spend time with us. And we can feel honored that they've chosen to spend time here with us. They're here to grow and learn, and for sure grow in their mental aspects. But they don't leave the other aspects of themselves at home. When they come here, they see very few people who look like them, and very few people who speak their languages. Many Native students experience, or will have experienced, one or more deaths, and their fair share of what we call the white path on the medicine wheel, the death and dying of loved ones, even as students. She lost her dad, her uncle, and her grandmother last year. She lost her mom a couple of years back. He lost his dad about three years ago. She's passed. She was the mom of another one of our students. And he died last year. He was an honorary Native. Natives here in the South, in general, experience shorter lifespan than folks in the U.S. population. We know that because American Indians are around 2% of the U.S. population, but only half a percent of those over 65. This is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And the Mississippi Department of Human Services has reported on SARS-CoV-2 infections and deaths with 18% of Mississippi natives testing positive compared to 10% of the general Mississippi population compared to 9% of the general US population. And of those who tested positive, 6.1% of Mississippi natives passed, which translates into Mississippi natives losing 1% of their population. According to the Arizona Department of Health, 5% of the statewide COVID cases occur within Native American populations, and 8% of the deaths. This is a state where Native Americans are only 4.3 of the population. And yeah, these statistics vary by tribe, but all too often, it's a similar story. This is Ryan, who was to be our head man in 2020 when we had to cancel the powwow because of COVID. COVID. Ryan, this young man, this tradition keeper, straight dancer, hand drum singer, social dancer, and language speaker, Ryan, passed. We're going to honor him tonight, and others in the sound. In general, natives with about five years less than the general population, but this is even more revealing. Only 3.9 of southeastern natives, or 3.9% of southeastern natives are in the elder category, and that's compared to 16% in that same category of just general southeastern residents. That's a health disparity. That's because of these health disparities. And there are numerous disparities with alcohol, fatty liver disease, diabetes, all kinds of things topping the list. And also we're less active, we eat fewer fruits. We're studying that actually with this group of, um, of embrace scholars right now. Some of these disparities are caused by, are caused by preventable chronic diseases that can be mitigated somewhat by diet and physical activity, and we're studying those particular diseases in this program. So when three of my own friends died during just one year, I started thinking about the cultural work that I was doing in the context of all of what had happened. 
And I started to think about how hard it is to preserve stories, language, basket weaving, dressmaking, cooking, knowledge of plants when our elders leave us so early. I had a friend who introduced me to Dr. Lee Max, who was part of this program. And during that time, she was doing work on health disparities. She's a nutritionist. And I asked her to work with me on health disparities in Native communities because our elders and culture keepers were dying way too early. And so we're tackling those health disparities with a focus on disparities that are related to preventable chronic diseases. Our folks rely on elders and people like Ryan for the transmission of culture, of language, of traditional ecological knowledge, and these important aspects of our tribes are passed from elders to youth. So we bring Native students to Southern Miss for 10 weeks in the summer, and they're sitting in this room right now. And we pay them, and we train them in health disparities research and outreach. Before COVID, our big outreach event, of course, was the Choctaw Indian Fair. And all the students loved that and listed that as the most fun thing that they did. We bring them here so that they will better understand the causes and the consequences of these preventable chronic diseases in their own tribes and be better able to be, intervene in whatever way they can when they graduate from whatever program they graduate from in college. We know from the Okala Achukamo project that social support is a factor in maintaining diet and physical activity goals. We, with your support, we're helping to explore ways to improve social support in our communities. We know that fatalism plays a role because we see so many people with diabetes and we might begin to feel like diabetes is inevitable, that's fatalism, and we're exploring ways to address fatalism. You all have told us that looking and feeling better, leaving, living longer, avoiding amputations, healthy cooking, prevention of illness are reasons to eat better and be more physically active. We learned that through focus groups that we've had with the community. You all have told us that junk food tastes better, it's more convenient, it's less expensive than healthy food. And also that tradition plays a role in our eating salt meat and pork and fried bread and other high fat foods. We have seen in other research that these medicine will teach us. They speak to holistic approaches to living and, and they speak to that balance that we need to maintain and they've been helpful and addressing these issues and these teachings may help us down here as well. And please know that we need you to stay around. We need for our elders to stay around. I know that these students need you to stay around because I'm one of those students, one of those first generation students who went to the military to get money for college the one whose dad passed while I was at college, the one who lost a mom when she was just 10 years old, and the one who was adopted out as a baby because my biological mother couldn't support me or my brother. My mother, who was born on a houseboat and raised by the nuns in New Orleans because her mother couldn't support her because her grandparents unknowingly signed away their property to an oil company with their ex mm -hmm. and went to live on Aldegine Charles in a palmetto hut like this. The island, who was once a forest and could support herself and lots of plants and lots of animals and my grandparents and other people's grandparents as well, but who now is almost all in the sea and whose college kids have to worry about finding a new home as they study for these tests. And maybe all of that hasn't happened to some of you. Maybe none of it has happened to some of you. But medicine will teachings tell me that all of us can identify with all of that. We can identify with the newness of encountering college when no one you know has ever been there the being off balance like a baby who is wobbly as they want to walk, like our students encountering a totally different culture, and when they're new as a motherless or fatherless child. And we can all identify with the intense need for practice as we grow and learn about our independence 
and back and forth that is necessary to stay fully connected to our communities, how we practice the schoolwork, and practice helping out our struggling families, and we can identify with mastering schoolwork and the college culture and being away from home. And we can all identify with the path of death and dying that we experience way too much of at an early age in our communities. We can call on all of our experiences, the experiences in our own circles, and understand more completely the struggles of our communities. And we need to understand so that we can walk with our students on this wheel. We know that our Native students need their families, their support systems, and their communities. Some students say that they never had a friend who was not Native before coming to Southern Miss. And most all of them want to return to their tribes and be of service, help support their families, and make their families proud. And I'm glad of that. Because our Native communities need college graduates to participate in tribal government to research these diabetes cures, to look after tribal artifacts, to research our South Southeastern American Indian symbols, to address major health disparities, to advocate for the protection of sacred and culturally significant lands, to write grants to support language learning, to be role models as teachers, pastors, psychologists, principals, attorneys, photographers, artists, dancers, morticians, microbiologists, Police officers, nurses, college professors, chiefs, urologists, and wait for it, we need a Native community Secretary of Interior. Hang on. You got that? We need bridges between these two worlds. Thank you for letting your kids come to these universities and build these bridges between these two worlds. And I want to thank Embre and the Teller Nutrition Center for supporting this bridge building with our <coughs> communities as we all head toward more healthy and longer lives. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs> we are going to rest here. She's going to lead us out. We are going out to the medicinal garden for the rest of this ceremony. So we've got somebody stationed in the back, somebody who knows the way. Sarah, will you go? Sarah's gonna lead us out to the medicinal garden and we're gonna find some chairs for the elders and the rest of us if you can stand that would be fun. Hey, Dan. We're a good talk here for a beginner. <laughs> <laughs>